we're a third generation family business. I like to think that we pride ourselves on, you know, producing a product that is consistent, you know, year in and year out and meets all the industry tests and markers that it, that it should do. Welcome back to another episode of A Kiwi Original. Today on the show, I'm joined by Barry Hance from Hance Honey. This is a company that has been around for more time than most, not just in the honey sector. This is a third generation business. Any business that lasts beyond one generation is something to be admired in New Zealand. And Hence Honey heralds from a small district called Leeston, just south of Christchurch, uh, on the cusp of Lake Ellesmere. And that's where their honey hives is. And we're going to be talking about the honey making process, talk about what the beekeeping industry is going through currently, and also some of the future plans that Hans Honey has under the current leadership and guidance of Barry. So first of all, Barry, I'd just like to say welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Thanks for um, having us. You are welcome. So let's start with the the family side and the business side of it. So you're a third generation business, which makes you the third generation. Uh, what's it like to inherit something that, um, or, or or take control of something that you've probably known since you were a child? Yeah, it's um, it, when I first um, started, it was um, it's very exciting, um, and um, we've had a few. I've been um, back in the business for about eighteen years now. Um, I did. Personally, I did something else for seven years after I left school, so I've had a bit of a background in, in another industry. Um, so yeah, but uh, it was um, beekeeping was one of those things when I was a kid that um, we used to go and help dad out and stuff like that, and it was something that I wasn't sure if I was um, if I liked it or not. But yeah, if you don't give it a go, then you don't know. So um, so that's what I did, and um, yeah, and I've, and I'm still here. So and 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 now also I have. Um, I have an older sister that's um, that's been in, working in the business in the last three or four years, and now she's um, she's just been um, she is a shareholder in the company as well now. So um, so yeah, so we're back to a, um, a family business. It was um, started by my by, by my grandfather. Um, basically, um, he was a um, a farm labourer and um, had an interest in bees, and um, basically it just started from there. Um, and as yeah, late. 20s, early 30s, he was um, just a hobbyist beekeeper and, and sort of after a few years of doing that, he, I think he seen a, um, um, an opportunity out there on the farms that he was working on that, um, for, for some beehives and, um, and, and producing honey. So, and then, um, so they gradually built it up um, from basically starting from nothing and then, um, then my father and, and his brother, um, they were in partnership together um, when they both left school they worked in the family business um, they I think my father was quite keen to go to university but he wasn't allowed <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah so, and um, and they they were in partnership till 1996 and then my uncle decided to um, um, he had a few health issues um, regarding his back so he had, um, he they split the partnership and then my father um, kept half of the hives and then um, yeah just gradually with um, for a few years, um, then I came on board and we've gradually built the business up in hive numbers since um, since we um, yeah since I've been in, in the in the business and we're up to about the, this coming season we'll be up to nearly four thousand hives that we'll be running. Um, so yeah, it's pretty pretty full on and um, very interesting. In the time that um, you and your sister have currently been running it. What are the things that you have uh, inherited from the, the families, those early decisions that, you know, Liz and Maisie have, have made, you know, way back 50, 60 years ago uh, that are, are still things that you have to uh, caretake and look after versus the things that you're thinking, actually, I want to do something brand new with some of the assets we've got or, or bring in some brand new things. Um, what are some examples of those? Yeah, I, I guess... Um I've always been. Um, I I know that my father and, and my uncle have run a. They ran a successful business, and and I'm not. 
obviously it has worked for the last you know 30 40 years before um before i came on board so obviously they there's a the potential out there to keep doing what they're doing and just sort of you know diversify when when necessary um i guess the farming practices has been a huge thing um in our business and what has also changed um in the last sort of um 15 odd years in the mid canary area where we have um, pretty much all of our hives um there's been a huge growth in small seed production so that's growing radish seed and, and carrot seed where they need the bees to um pollinate um so they basically have a what they call a male and a female flower. So they need the bees to take the pollen from the male flower and, and um, fertilise the um, female flower, and then that's the, the one that they harvest. So that, I mean, so that that's been grown in our area. So we've diversified and and put on more hives so we can put um, hives into crops for pollination. Um, and that's been a that's been a, a really big. Um, Diversification, I guess, that's happened in our business in the last sort of, um, you know, 15 odd, odd years. When I first started here, we would do probably maybe 200 hives a year or something like that for those crop pollinations. And now we're doing over 2,000. Wow. Uh, that's a huge shift. For those crops. So, um, yeah, yeah. And that's, um, you know, and I've, I've learned from my father that you, you should always do. You should always do what's in in your area. You know, if you've got hives in that area and that farmer requires bees for his for his crop pollination or, or whatever, then then you should then you should be doing it. You know, there's um, with the with other um, parts of the industry like the manuka industry that's been um, huge um, growth in the last you know ten fifteen years as well. There's been people that have you know had hives in in our area and just taken them away and gone to do produce manuka honey so um yeah it's um it's one of those things that we yeah we, we like to um as i say do what do what's in our area and and keep the, the farmers happy and um and then it works for everybody and it also means for the bees they get to do what the bees are you know mother nature has designed bees to do it's not just the production of honey it's the pollita- pollination of, of flowers and if they're doing yep. that for the broader ecosystem for other crops that's actually helping the broader agricultural sector within the Canterbury region. Yeah, that's exactly right. And um, there's um, a lot of the bees have a direct or indirect effect on basically about you know up to sixty percent of what of the food that people eat. You know, if you have your as I've said quite often as on your dinner plate, about a you know two thirds of what's on that plate will have a, a direct or indirect effect from from bees pollinating something. You know, even from you know from your um, the good old kiwi beef and stuff like that. You know, they that has an indirect effect because of the clover that the, the, the beef have probably eaten in the pasture and stuff like that. So um, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of you know um, out of the box, I suppose, outside the box, so to speak, on on what bees you know the ten- potential that they that they the food that they produce. Is it true then that Barry, the, the the health of a bee population within you know Canterbury or within New Zealand reflects the the health of our growing sector, like our, our, as of our food producing sector? Yeah, I guess the um, the health of bees has is a lot. Um, it's a lot different than what it was, say, you know, 15 years ago. And the, the major factor that we've had is the, um, the varroa mite that was injured, well, was, um, found in New Zealand and, um, in the early 2000s, I think it was in Auckland. And, um, yeah, that, and that's brought in a lot of other, um, pest, uh, well, diseases and, and stuff with the bees. So, um, like having nutritious bees now is a lot harder, um, than what it was then 15 years ago. You know, we, we feed like pollen sub, sub, substitute um, and that nowadays, and we never ever used to do that because there was always something out there for the bees to forage on, you know. And and also the other thing is that, um, you know, the dairy farming industry and and um, and um, even, the, even the cropping um, industry is, it's all about um, using every space or every piece of, land that they have and and making a making a dollar off it um and you know fence lines and gorse fences and stuff like that that used to be in an abundance around the 
um, around the Canterbury area are, are very um, and tree lines and stuff like that are, are very there's, there's not as many of them anymore and, and that's partly has to do with that was the irrigation um, that most farmers have nowadays with um, centre pivots and laterals and stuff like that so um, but it's about um, you know making the best of, of the circumstances that you have you know that the, the tree lines and stuff are gone due to irrigation, but the the other side of the story is that you know there's there's water for them to put on their crops and and make crops flower and stuff like that, and um, which is a benefit to us that it actually um, gives the flowers a longer time, especially with clover. Um, it gives it it can you can actually get a um, a, a yield a crop yield off it um, every year, other than before they had irrigation it was you know it was really hit and miss it would burn off really quick because they couldn't um there was no irrigation for the crops right so you've seen that some of the incidental uh plantings uh has decreased but the amount of uh intentional plantings has increased or at least the flowering potential of those crops has increased through irrigation yeah yeah and i guess the other um I know that yeah, people have got to pull stuff down, but there are a lot of farmers that are replanting, you know, um, riparians and, and that sort of thing. And in the areas where they they don't have, um, they would don't get irrigation and stuff like that. So, um, but it's just that I guess I'd say we're in that sort of transitioning phase of where it's it's quite easy to um, pull hedge lines out and stuff like that, but um, to make them grow again to where those ones potentially were, it takes a long time. So, <laughs> and that's in that where we're probably heading to at the moment. What should those farmers be uh, looking to, uh, what, what should they be planting to get the bees happy? Um, there is a, there's been a project on the go for the last oh, probably seven, eight, nine years called Trees for Bees. Um, so that is a, um, a, a project that um, has been running in, 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 and in areas so basically, it's a website now where um, you can look up in in your area. You can see what native species um, can will grow in your in your area, and also, and also what time of the year it flowers, and um, and that sort of thing, which is really um, really helpful for, um, for for the beekeeper. So if, if farmers are, are wanting to you know know what to plant in their area, they can have a look on the Trees for Bees website and, and it'll tell them what plants are best to plant. And um, also the other thing is at what time of the year it would be really beneficial if they planted um, lots of things that plant that had flowered um, the whole all year round instead of just um, nominating a, a whole lot of plants that just, you know, um, flower in the springtime or in the autumn time or something like that. And, yeah, if they mix and match and get them, um, which would be a, which is a huge, a huge benefit to um, the beekeepers. Well, it'd certainly make your job managing those four thousand hives a, a little bit easier if you knew that the, the broader ecosystem had uh, a- enough drive-through takeaways for the bees to yeah. to, <laughs> to get their their fill of some nutritious food. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Question I had, uh, which I've written down my notes here, is queen bee. So you guys actually breed queen bees. How yeah, do you we breed do. a queen bee? Um, it's a pretty, it's a, it's an interesting process. Um, so yeah, we we do breed queen bees and we sell them. Um, we sell a few to a couple of other beekeepers um, that don't that um, yeah that use them. So so basically, it's um, yeah we run we run little small hives, what we call nucleus hives. So they have they're about the uh, half the size of a of a one box hive, and so we use those for raising queens. So we we can manipulate a um, a, a hive, and and we put basically these we produce queen cells. And to do the to to produce a queen cell, you have to take eggs or um, pupae larvae from a from a frame out of a hive that you want to breed from, and then you put. Um, basically, you take one egg out of a cell in that frame and put it in a in a cell cup, and then you basically put all these these cell cups. You put them in a in a hive without a queen, and then they will they will feed, and you wow. keep feeding that hive um, syrup. Um, and this is the way we do it. There are other ways of doing it, but um, 
yeah, and you feed that syrup, and then those bees in that hive will feed those um, feed those eggs and and those queen cell cups, and until you get to a certain point. So basically, when you put the when you put the the grub into the queen cell, you have um, basically 14 days after that it should hatch. So um, give or take a day. So so you, therefore you work out when you do your what we call doing a graph of putting those eggs in the in the cell cups, and then 14 days you need to um, be thinking about how you're gonna where you're gonna put those those cells. So, uh, and what we do is, in the nuclear size we do is once we, so we put a cell in there and then it'll hatch in a couple of days. And then, so then um, the virgin, the, the queen um, is, um, she hatches as a virgin queen. So then what happens is she'll be in there for a, um, when you're up to two or three weeks, depending on the time of the year. Sometimes it can be up to four weeks and also depending on the weather. Um, and then she will fly. The Virgin Queen will fly out of the out of the new hive, and then she will mate with the drone bees. So the drones are the male bees. So she will try and mate with as many drone bees as she can, and uh, and she does that while she's flying around in the air. And then when she thinks she's um, mated with enough, then she'll fly back. Um, hopefully, she'll fly back to the same uh, new uh, or hive that she's come from. You'd want then, that, otherwise you you put all this effort in and the, you've lost your queen bee who's now living yep. somewhere else. Yep, so that happens if they try and that comes down to the weather. If you, you know, if you get a whole lot of, in the springtime, if you get a whole lot of nor'westers like we can do in the, in the Canary Plains, um, they can get, and, they, and if they're in there day after day and they get, as they get longer, or, you know, a few days, into it, then they think, oh, they must get out. So sometimes potentially they might try and fly um, or mate on a day when it's really windy or something like that. So potentially when they come back, they get blown off course and then they'll probably, if they land the wrong nuke, the one that it didn't come from, then if there's one in there, they'll have a, they'll basically have a scrap and one will, one will, um, one will die. So, um, yeah, so you're ever reliant on the, on the weather and, um, yeah, when you get really good weather, you can get really high percentages of um, queen mating. So you can get up to sort of, you know, sometimes you can get close to 100%. You might get to 95, but then sometimes you can get way down to 60 or 70 as well. So, which is um, which fears for a lot of extra work. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the other uh, main jobs that make up the working week at Hans Honey with you and the team? Yeah, so I guess in our in our um, business, we're very um, diverse. I guess we do basically everything and anything in the beekeeping industry. From as I said, we uh, we produce, we raise queens and to sell, and then we um, we produce obviously clover honey, and then we pack our own brand of clover honey, which is sold domestically. Um, and then also we do um, we do our honey ex- um, extraction, and we do that for other beekeepers as well. So um, and then also the honey packing we do for other beekeepers a few so um, yeah we do and then we do the pollination of seed crops and um, yeah so basically anything and, and, and everything and, and next um, next season we're venturing into producing a bit of manuka honey so um, yeah which is the first the first for us in a in a um, yeah I guess a different direction for our our business to take so um yeah we've never done it in the past and um now yeah, we're about to so we'll um, certainly see what it's see what it's all about what makes now the time to venture into manuka right when you know, your your business hasn't just learned about it it's obviously been around for some time and there's plenty of players in the market there's plenty of demand for uh, manuka at various strengths internationally. Why now does it make sense for Hans Honey? Um, there's two sort of reasons. Um, basically, where the the price of of the clover honey is at the moment is really, really, really low. Um, the bulk price that is um, what the beekeeper is getting in a in a drum, um, and it's sort of you know it's at the point where you know it's nearly at um, for some people, it's probably at cost of production um, or, or lower. So we, we, I mean, in our business in the last few years, it's been the pollination that's been 
um, sort of helped us out and um, been a been been a, a good side for us in our business. But that this year our numbers are looking like they might be back a little bit more on the highs required for crop pollination. Um, so and um, and the other thing was that the this, there was an opportunity to to buy some hives on a on a manuka um, on a farm from a um, a retiring beekeeper. So um, we sort of thought it would be a good opportunity to to get into it. You know, and um, as you're probably aware, and most people are aware, there's been a lot of huge industry growth in the in the manuka um, honey production and. Um, there's been a lot of fighting between beekeepers for sites and, and that sort of thing, and that's, um, to be honest, that's never been an option for me to go up there and you know and try and push another beekeeper off a off a manuka site. So I've always been um, thought if the opportunity arose that where we could possibly buy some hive on a site and maybe put a few more on or whatever, um, that we would give it a go. So it's, um, yeah, it sort of just yeah popped up and. Um, we thought we'd give it a go and, and see see how it goes. So um, yeah, you know the, the manuka industry is certainly, you know, it, it's a good, it's a really really good product, um, and it has it has huge, it really has huge potential to go a bit further. I think, um, yeah, probably with a bit more with a bit more research. So um, yeah, so that's probably a couple of reasons why we're, we're diversifying. Sorry to interrupt. This won't take long. Subscribe to the show and you'll never miss another one of these amazing episodes. Right back to the show. It, it makes sense in that when um, when there is a, a new industry that Manuka is relatively new to honey overall in New Zealand, you have a, um, just like with craft beer, when that took off, there was already normal, you know, normal beer. Uh, yeah. then you have uh, this huge growth in different players and then over time some of those get well funded or sold or acquired and then there's a group there that's left that you know are kind of either breaking even or don't have the capital to get to that get to that next stage and where you've got like the you know the the large breweries for example will acquire a, a very good brand like an emerson's uh, and take yeah. it on and keep it exactly the same and keep the same team uh, yeah. Is it the same in honey, or am I making a terrible analogy here, Barry? Um, I guess um, there's. I guess the product, the product is still the same. I guess is the is the, probably the biggest thing. Like you can produce, um, like for instance, the clover honey. You can produce it from one one operation but then an operation down the road you still have the same product which i guess is different from you know the, the brewery side of things where everybody can make it taste different but um they can in a in a way with clover i mean with with honey but um i still at the end of the day it's a it's honey in new zealand is 100 percent honey and there's nothing added to it or anything like that so um it's still a raw product that, you, that you're dealing with and um, you do get different um, honeys from different areas that have um, different tastes, like from down um, down south, um, down central Otago and places like that, and then the Winooka and stuff get in the in the North Isle, and then and basically the cross the crosses in between. Um, Is that right? So if I was to to try a Hence honey versus a honey that had been produced central North Island or you know Tauranga or, or north of Auckland. What what would be the taste difference? What's what's different, and and why does that happen? I guess the, the way to answer that is why it happens is is basically what the bees are, are gathering. So like like for instance, what we produce the clover honey. So that we we get that off basically um, clover that's growing for seed. So for seed crops. So it's really high intense. Um, flowering in a paddock um, and, and there's a lot of it I mean you can get clover honey that's produced in um, in the central North Island you know in, in Waikato and, and places like that they're another bigger producer of it but the, the clover honey that they get is from a pasture base so it's from a oh. from the from the um, clover that's flowering in the pasture crops so um, yeah and and, um, and the taste is and up there also there's probably because it's a pasture crop, there's other stuff flowering. As with down here, with the, it's basically 
um, high intense um, clover flowers that that we get a, a really good um, and a really light coloured honey. And the, I mean, I, I, the clover that we the honey that we clover honey that we produce is, is um, it's we can get some really light colours, and they can do down down south further as further you go down south, but um, beekeepers around Twizel and in Central Otago, they can get some really nice clover honeys as well. But, um, that's your yeah. creamy clover brand, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So, so looking for lightness in the honey, honey, at least in clover honey, is the is a sign of a a, a different flavour profile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we always say the life of the honey, the clover honey, is the better it the better it should be. Well, yeah. And the and the um, the Asian market, like the Japanese, um, they they love clover honey, and they 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 are after the the white stuff. But they they think that the the whiter the honey it is, um, or the lighter it is, that the better it is, and um, that's stuff that they they chase. Um, yeah, which is which is good for us. At what stage in, with the business did you get into the the exporting side of it? Um, so we have, um, yeah, we've exported um, pack product for a number of years. Um, I guess it's just sort of um, the, the the clients that we have have just sort of turned probably turned up um, rather than us actually chasing it. So, uh, but some of them have sort of we've dealt with, you know, for thirty you know, 30 odd years. Um, wow. plus most of them were started by, uh, with my, with my father and, um, uh, we've, um, carried on supplying them and, and, um, yeah, trying to, trying to, um, um, build, build new markets. So yeah, at the present point in time, we, um, export a little bit to a client in Switzerland. Um, we export a bit to a client in America, um, and, in Malaysia. And, um, yeah, and just at the present point in time, we're talking to a couple of other um, new clients that hopefully um, something might come of it in the next couple of months, So, which should be really, um, really exciting. So, um, yeah, hopefully it'll, it'll, we can get all our ducks in a row and, um, yeah, we can um, get, it, get it going. I guess the, um, the, the export side of things is where, I guess New Zealand in general needs to um, expand. Um, because been, yeah, and that's why we have low bulk honey prices at the moment because there's been basically an oversupply um, for the last sort of three or four years. And um, yeah, and, and we need to we need to try and expand our export markets a whole lot more. And I think the um, yeah for for us. Um, in the honey in the honey industry, the the COVID um, nineteen crisis has been um, has been a positive, I guess, because there's, after that the, the honey sales have certainly export wise, there's been a lot more interest. And in, I know I've heard talk to a few other people, and um, yeah, there's a lot of honey going offshore at the moment, which is which is really good because this time last year you couldn't even hardly sell a jar of honey. <laughs> That's amazing, and it, it makes sense because when you're uh, when you're in a, a market where there's too much supply, either there has to be a reduction of supply, or that supply needs to be taken out of the market. And exports a great way of doing it that doesn't harm the business or the the people it employs. And um, how what makes a successful export relationship? Because you know, there's, there's a lot that has to, a lot of water that has to go under the bridge in order to get to what you probably have with three decades of trust with maybe another generational family on their side. Um, yep. How do you go about that now with the ones that you know you, you're at the very start of that process with to to make sure that you know they're around in three decades with you? Yeah, well, I guess it's um, it's all about producing a. Um, a really good product and a consistent product, um, and also it really needs to um, meet all the all the markers, as in all the testing and stuff like that um, for for the export quality honey. Um, you know, there's been a lot of um, there's been a lot of coverage by um, overseas media and stuff about the Manuka honey and, and that sort of thing, and and some of it, you know, not 
passing the right tests and all this sort of carry on. But I mean, we've sort of we I, I like to think that we pride ourselves on you know producing a product um, that is consistent you know year in and year out um, and um, meets all the um, industry tests and markers that it, that it should do. And I think if that's if if everybody can do that, um, I think that would and that that builds that builds trust with your with your clients overseas. And um, and it should just expand from there. Where does the uh, New Zealand made honey sit versus other countries' honey? Where where are we in the pecking order of things? Um, so I guess um, we we export New Zealand exports a lot of honey around the around the world market. Um, we are a we are a small. Um, in comparison to other um, honey countries around the world, we're a small exporter of it compared to in volume wise. But our but our um, our product that we sell has has a really good reputation. Um, but you know, it, it's 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 some people, yeah, doing stupid things along the way that can it only takes one person to. You know, do something wrong that detriments it to to everybody else. And um, you know, the other thing that with um, our exports is that um, that I think one of the big things is that we our country is GE free. Um, so that has been in the past a, a really good um, sales pitch for New Zealand honey. Um, you know, I've, I've heard of, um, for instance, like Canadian honey um, going into the into Europe. Into the EU, you know, they once they um, the Europeans found out that it was um, was the honey was made from um, GE crops. Mm. Um, they did not; they don't want to eat it, and they just wow. just shut the border just like that. And that's where they came to us and started buying um, a lot more. So um, yeah, it's just the, the the small things like that. I think have certainly certainly helped us along the way. That's super interesting that uh, a country like Canada would would take the the opportunity to do things more efficiently, which GE gives you, but not yeah. take into consideration what they potentially meant for what consumers wanted or the regulation based on what consumers wanted in some of their export yeah. markets. Yeah, yeah, but you know, it, it takes. Um, I know, I know they're sending. I think they're sending honey back to Canada, but you know, it's just the way that. Way things happen, and they have to prove, you know, that it's um, their product is, is safe to eat, and, and all that sort of thing. Even though it, it is, but it's um, you just have to prove it, <laughs> which takes time. <laughs> okay, so we've covered the the honey side of it, the bees, the export markets, uh, a, a little bit on the the family side. We haven't covered the the team aspect of it um, because it's quite a seasonal business, right? You've got to uh, employ everyone for the the, the harvest uh, months of, of honey making and then there's this hibernation mode how do you make sure that you you know you you get the people that you you want and keep them be able to keep them on when there's actually not as much work as, as you go into the winter months yeah so um, we um, we employ all our employees as, as permanent full-time um, employees so they have worked yeah, all year round. Um, so there is certain things that you can do, like um, so. There's basically sort of three months of the year, May, June, and July, in, in our operation that we're not, probably not actively visiting hives um, every day. So um, that gives us an opportunity to do maintenance and to do, um, you know, re uh, building new equipment and new boxes and all that sort of thing um, in, the, in those in those winter months. So um, that's that's yeah that's what we do you know um, probably if you did the if you did the cost analysis it's probably more expensive you know to to buy the equipment and put it together and and make it but um, but it gives you know <laughs> gives our guys you know a job to do in the winter and you know um, for the time they take you know majority of the holidays within those three months it, it soon comes around again to, to start. So um, yeah, you know, there's a lot of other uh, 
companies do it differently where some of them will give them three months off and um yeah and we're we're really flexible with that we've had the odd one or two employees that have um you know had a couple of a couple of months off you know one's usually paid and the other one they've taken as unpaid leave so and they've gone um gone overseas or what have you so yeah it's it's a sort of a flexible time and um yeah we're, we're pretty pretty adaptable but if there's for their employees if they if they can to work through that time we'll, we'll find them something to do it's a good with, with, you, yeah sorry go for it way, yeah with the way beekeeping is now we're pretty much you know we're doing quite a bit of um, beekeeping work actually during the winter like with um varroa treatment and stuff like that so um yeah i like what really it's really becoming a, a 12 month um of the year um beekeeping nowadays i'm getting close to it well, when you've got four thousand hives there's an economy of scale there where you can shift around your people to do those maintenance roles and um, that's probably something i hadn't considered before even though you're a seasonal business at at that scale yep. there's there's always going to be a hive that needs replacing yeah yeah absolutely and there's yeah no it was always um always want something to do and you know there's always there's always the odd time that one of the girls that does the packing is away so you know you need someone to fill that um fill that for a day or whatever so there's plenty of um there's a, a lot of um, experience in what we what we do from day to day what's coming up barry uh in the um technology innovation side of things that's that's moving uh, beekeeping and, and honey production forward that that maybe you're you're considering or have looked at and said no not not for now or or are actively you know wanting to get involved and in, if you're able to share yeah look i guess um beekeeping is one of those industries that it's um you can't really the only thing that you can modernize i guess for um, want of a better word is is the baby the way that you process the honey um or extract the honey or, or pack the honey or how you shift your hives but the actual um the there's nothing that will ever beat um a person actually physically sticking their head in a beehive you know and, and looking at it um there are there are lots of different tools out there um nowadays that you can that you can use like you can um there's a system out there where you can have scales under your hive so you can monitor how much honey that the hive is basically bringing in and you can look at it on your smartphone and, and what have you and there's lots of other there's um other systems out there that you can yeah what you can read the moisture in the hive and and um there's one that actually counts the bees as they fly in and out wow uh, all this all this sort of thing but I, I guess um yeah there's, there's nothing there's nothing that's gonna beat the you know a human sticking their head in the hive and um physically working it and looking at the looking at the queen or looking at the hive or whatever so for someone in their you know early 20s even late teens now thinking they're going to pick up uh, an apprenticeship or or get into beekeeping and spend that you know two or three years understanding what it's like from what you're saying is that that's going to actually stand them in good stead to to work on the hives into the future no matter what automation or technology comes about yeah look, I, I guess it's um yeah there's a lot of um it, it takes time to be to be a skilled beekeeper um you know some some guys think they can you know have the gift of it after 12 months or, or reading reading everything on youtube or in a, in a book or what have you but there's, there's nothing that beats beats experience and to be a confident beekeeper, I, I suggest that it probably takes about five years. Um, I I know from when I first started, um, I did three years, and you do three years, and you think um, you, you think you know it all, but then you do you do the next two years, and then you sort of you get to that five year mark, and you sort of look back and you think, well, yeah, no, I didn't really know everything, but um, yeah, I, you feel a lot more confident when you get to that five year mark, and and confidence in making probably the right decision at the right time um, because basically that's what beekeeping comes down to is making the right decision at the right time um, and yeah if you don't do that then you don't produce you don't have bees in your eyes and you don't have you don't produce honey it just takes that time i think within any industry to see 
what happens when you when you make the wrong decisions uh, or when you don't pick up a, a signal and i'm sure when you look into a hive you just have a feel for how those those bees are behaving that tells yeah. you a whole bunch that you know maybe yeah. at, at three years you knew some of the signals but you didn't know the overall picture of where it would end up yeah yeah that, that, that's right and, and it takes you yeah, that, that long too to work out what hives do um in in certain areas like and um, with honey production wise and, and that sort of thing um that, that just all comes with with knowledge and and um, experience really is there anything else before we wrap up, Barry, that I haven't asked you or, or areas that you, you would like to cover uh, in terms of what Hans Honey is doing? Uh, no, I think we've pretty much um, covered it all. You know, we, we're, as, as you said at the start, there, we're a third generation family business, and um, I'm certainly, um, I'm certainly definitely keen to. Um, yeah, you know, pass the mantelpiece over one day. I have a um, couple of young boys and a young daughter that hopefully might, um, yeah, step up to the plate. So, you know, and that's um, that's been my philosophy and and what we've done and um, since I've been here is to, um, you know, to, to make a sustainable business for them if they decide that they want to give it a go. So, um, I know my my father did that to me, so I I, um, I certainly want to do that to um, to my children. So. Um, so yeah, I guess that's my that's my basically my main aim. Um, yeah, and we'll we'll see what happens along the way. <laughs> that's an, an amazing uh, goal because you're you it means you're building something for legacy, and that enables you to make decisions uh, for the business now that are longer lasting for for all your stakeholders, even the youngest ones. How yeah. how old are each of your your three your two boys and girls? Uh, so, um, so the oldest one, I've got a daughter, Maisie, who's nine, and then I've got a um, son, Bo, who's seven, and then a, um, and Harry, who is two and a half. So, so yeah, so I've got a, a few more years to go, but um, yeah, hopefully. And have they gone out to and collected honey? I'm, I'm imagining with the two and a half year old might be a bit young just yet. Yeah. Yeah, he hasn't been out so much, but um, oh no, him, him and him and his mum come out uh, when we're shifting, when I'm shifting hives at night and stuff like that. But the the other two have definitely come out and have, when I've been shifting bees at night, and they can get on the end of the smoker and um, smoke the hives while I lift them on the truck and with the hive and with the crane and stuff. So yeah, yeah they um, they enjoy it. So um, yeah, yeah, no, it's um, it's really good that they take an active um, role at the moment. So. So, yeah, it's awesome. Very lucky indeed. I mean, what a, a magical childhood to be that close to, to nature and also, you know, be still be able to be around your parents and their work yeah. environment to, to uh, yeah. you know, get them indoctrinated into it or at least um, get a your, feeling for uh, what uh, it's like early. Yeah, my kids are lucky because I, go, I bought them a bee seat, so they're fully covered. But when I was a kid, I never had a bee seat. <laughs> <laughs> You just had to. You just had to grin and and bear it. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> well, um, thank you very much for your time today, Barry. I really appreciate you sharing the the Hans Honey story and yep. sharing some of the things that um, you're focused on at the moment uh, as the industry for honey in New Zealand is changing. And really exciting to hear your export plans. I think that's that's probably great news for um, not just those markets, but for the health of the the New Zealand uh, industry. I'm certainly yep. going to go to your website and pick up um, or go to, I think you're at the, you know, a number of the supermarkets, that creamy clover one. I want to I want to try that light honey and uh, taste some of the yep. differences. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So we, we, we're, our stockists, we're nationwide in, in Countdown. So most people in New Zealand will be able to purchase their, purchase their honey in their Countdown store. So um, yeah. That'll be me, toast on the weekend um, with some pita bread and maybe a little bit of uh, Pix peanut butter uh, made from down Nelson Way as well. Yeah, it sounds nice. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks very much. And uh, maybe we'll do another catch up in a year or so. See how you're getting on. Yeah, uh, lovely. Cool. Thank you. This has been a Kiwi original brought to you by the New Zealand Made team. Thanks for watching. Uh, the New Zealand Made trademark is used by over 1,200 businesses in New Zealand. Uh, the New Zealand Made team licenses that trademark. Check if you're eligible at buynz.org.nz. If you feel that someone should see this, share it with them now. Otherwise, subscribe to youtube.com forward slash buynzmade and we'll see you on the next episode.